All right, what's going on? We got a very, very interesting show today. Um, I'm very excited to have this person on, but right now I want to also start off by thanking everybody who's been tuning in, sharing, liking on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and YouTube. Please subscribe and like. The Aftershock Network is getting bigger and bigger every single time we go on, and um, it's been more shows than I can swing a stick at, and I'm not going to stop until we're the best damn fucking podcast on YouTube. I want to be... Joe Rogan, that's how I want to be Joe Rogan successful. It's not every day you have a number one bestseller, best-selling author on my show anyway. And I want to introduce the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Ian Halpern. Hey, pleasure to be here, man. And let me tell you something. What, what Rogan makes in a year, you'll soon be making in a morning the way you're going. So don't worry about it. I could really use it right now. I can you tell can you that. It. Everybody can use it, man. We're living like rats. We're I know. We're living like rats right now. So, hey, let's talk about why you're here. What have you been working on? I know you have a new book coming out, and yeah. you promised that you were going to drop some bombshell oh, yeah. shit here. But I'll tell you this, man. And First of all, congrats on your show here. I'm a huge fan. And, yeah, you will be making those numbers. Trust me. Just stay on the playing field, and you're going to get to the finish line sooner than later because there people want to hear real content and most of the content is just complete bs out there everybody including the king of all media the alleged self-proclaimed king of all media but my new book controversy sex lies and dirty money available on amazon now it really gets into epstein i'm the only journalist to ever interview epstein at length wow. i interviewed him for about seven hours so what did he? Have, what does he have to say? Well, what did he have to say? He's a sociopath. Yeah, he comes across as legit, but the bottom line is, he said shit like, you know, eventually you see people's true cards. He said, you know, Ian, I'm living in the wrong era. I said, what do you mean? If I was living a hundred years ago, I could do whatever I want. There's no, you know, statute on age or anything. It was a free for all. He said, I wish I would have lived a hundred years ago, but. We got into it quite a bit. This was several years ago, quite a few years ago. I interviewed him for one of my books, and it was tough to get to him. Epstein hated the media, hated them. But through a good friend of mine who was friends with him at the time, he agreed to do it. And it turned into a seven-hour interview. Was so, it face-to-face? Face-to-face, man. Okay. We sat at Ben Ash Deli. Do you remember Ben Ash Deli? Of course I do, yeah, absolutely. Right across from the uh, Carnegie Deli? Yeah, sure. I live right there. Oh, you so you live in Hell's Kitchen? Yes, sir. I used to live there. Where? Uh, 50th and 10th. I live, uh, I, I'm not going to give out. I was around the corner. <laughs> well, give out the address. Nobody. Just I live 50, 51st and 9th. I love that area, man. Yeah. It, I, but now it's become a bit too commercial. Like, even 15 years ago, it was amazing. My favorite part of town. I know it very well where you live. Yeah. Uh, 9th is one of my favorite, really favorite places. It's a ghost town, brother. There's so many places closed down, man. I know. It's so sad. It, you know, we used to have the Film Cafe. Do you remember the Film Cafe on 45th and 9th? Yes. I used to go there. Yeah. Oh, there were great places. Now, you know, look, it will always come back. New York's coming back. But in my book, Controversy, Sex, Lies, and Dirty Money, I interview Epstein, and then I interview... Years later, all the people connected to Epstein, the closest confidants. And man, this guy was nuts. G. Lane Maxwell's in jail. She's a complete criminal, Steve. Yeah. Raped girls, raped boys. She should not be let out. Well, but how come what what's going on? How come they're not they're they're not doing anything with all that evidence and all the people that are tied into this pedophilia ring? Like I'm sorry, Dylan Kids is possibly, in my book, worse than capital murder. I, like, I'm sorry, I, children are innocent. They can't defend themselves. 100%. And, and, and they, it's, 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 it, they will deal with that damage for the rest of their lives. Okay? These people were professional sex traffickers. Top, yeah. top. This was a sophisticated operation run by Maxwell and Epstein. They were in cahoots. And then you have people like Bill Clinton, 26 log flights. In my book, I out him as taking 61 flights. Epstein didn't log a lot of the flights. That's well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something, because there's that controversial picture that there was Bill Clinton in a dress. 
yeah. at, at Pedophile Island. And yeah. Jennifer Flowers, who has a show on my network, yeah. she was on my show and told me that Bill used to like to dress up in her clothes. A bit of a cross-dresser. There's been a lot of rumors about Bill regarding that. But regardless of the painting and everything, he was inextricably linked to Jeffrey Epstein. And yet and also, he's walking around with no problems. Yeah. And there were others, many others. Leslie Wexner, head of uh, Limited Brands. I held him in the book as having a gay affair. He gave, look, he gave Epstein a sprawling apartment on 72nd in New York, the biggest apartment in New York. He gave him at a, at a cheap price. He gave him a mansion in Columbus, Ohio. Those two were deeply involved, and the people I interviewed said they were they were involved in a gay affair. And I have multiple, multiple corroboration from credible sources on that. So I interviewed everybody, everybody, and I wrote the book. But then along the research lines, because Epstein told me years ago, the only guy who could get more pussy than him in New York was Howard Stern. Really? The only guy, he said, who could get more puss than him in, in, in the Big Apple was Howard Stern. No, this is, this is a post-Allison, pre-horse girl. Yeah, well, exactly. Uh, you know, it, it, you're, <laughs> that is funny. Um, I'll say this. He was obsessed with Stern. He was obsessed with three or four famous people, Epstein. And really stalked them. He stalked Princess Diana excessively uh, back in the mid 90s. He tried to date her. And when he couldn't get a date with her, it was actually him. It was Jeffrey Epstein who made the connection to Dodi Fayette. He was friends with Dodi Fayette. They, he was handling some money for the Fayettes. And he introduced Di to Dodi. So if not for Jeffrey Epstein, Princess Di would still be alive today because she would have never met Dodi Fayette and wow. uh, ultimately never been in that car crash. So that killed them. And, Do and Muhammad Al-Fayed, Dodi's father, accuses the royal family of murder. And in my book, I outline the forensic pathological details and evidence that Epstein did not commit suicide. 1,000%. He, oh. he was found dead. In his jail cell. They found the, 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 like, they, they had like hand marks around his neck or something, didn't they? Well, yeah. And the ligature didn't match. There were two ligatures in, but also in the cell, and the guards fell asleep, and all the footage was erased. This was a professional job beyond even his own lawyer says there's no way he took his own life. And an independent forensic pathologist, one of the top in the world, came in, did a study, and said, no way. This does not look like a suicide. It was a pro job. A lot of people point the finger at the royal family again. Mohammed Al-Fayed accused them of murdering uh, Diana and Dodi. And in this case, Prince Andrew, if he was outed for sleeping with underage, it would have taken down the royal family. This he was outed, but even if you watch The Crown, he was into some weird perverted shit. Oh, I, I interviewed probably around 16 ex-lovers of Prince Andrew in the book, on the record, most of them. And, you know, I spent years researching this book, Controversy, and they really outlined what type of a sick puppy this guy is. Yeah, so now, Howard and Epstein, they were friends? They hung out? No. Epstein said, on the record, he said, look, I, he, he admitted it. He said, I stalked Diana, and I also stalked Howard Stern, and later on, Carla Bruni. Do you, think, do you think Howard was down that, on the island at all? Is that something that happened? Did he fly down there? No, or I, not? I, I doubt it. Howard used to not even get out of his basement except to go to the studio. So, so, so how, was he, how, was was he saying, how was he saying that he got more pussy than anybody else? Because he's a germaphobe. He's, he does, he's an agoraphobic no, he guy. He's the like... only guy who could get oh. more okay. pussy than me in New York's Howard Stern. Because he said, look, Howard's famous. He has strippers. Porn stars in the studio was nonstop. I don't know how Howard survived the Me Too movement. Siri, he escaped the Me Too movement completely because with all the racist things and the blackface and all the strippers and the hoes, come on, man. 
Me Too would have had a festival with Howard. But Epstein said he stalked Howard. He admitted it. He was openly, and his cohort, Claude Pepe, his right-hand man, said, oh, yeah, he knew everything about Howard. In fact, Claude Pepe claims, I've never seen it, he claims he even got, Epstein even got into Howard's computers at home and has some really revealing photos of Howard jerking off and, you know, photos of his penis. I've never seen them. But that's what his right-hand man said. So you're saying that this guy's got, got into Howard's computer and found, like, him a uh, picture of Howard masturbating. Yes, that's what he said. That's but you've you've seen no physical evidence of that. I haven't seen evidence, and I didn't put that in the book because you know I really just go on credible so corroboration. And what's what's put- what's in the book that is gonna like make people go no fucking way, and then well, you have proof for it? Well, first off, okay, because my last movie, I direct a lot of documentaries. I'm driving in L.A. one day, and I hear Roger Waters. My father's a Holocaust survivor. He hid in a hole at age six. And he only, you know, everybody died of starvation but him, his whole family. I'm driving in L.A. one day and I hear Roger Waters, Pink Floyd leader say, Israel's worse than Nazi Germany. I almost drove off a cliff, man. Are you Jew- Are you off. Jewish? What's that? You're, 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 you're Jewish. You're- I'm Jewish. Okay. Son of a Holocaust survivor. So I almost drove off a cliff. You know, when you're the son of a survivor, man, it's not easy. And, you know, you got to deal with a lot of issue your parents have. But so I did a film, Wish You Weren't Here. And I interviewed everybody all over the world. I even interviewed the Pope. I mean, as good as Howard is, has he ever interviewed the Pope one-on-one? No. All right. Which That's Pope? That's my barometer. Which I Pope? I interviewed the Pope. Which, which one? Francis. Okay. Uh, a couple of years ago, two, three years ago, I interviewed him at the Vatican and once at a synagogue, actually. So I met him twice. Wow. And nice guy. But <laughs> the thing I got to say is this with Howard. After interviewing everybody on the 36th floor, because I've done Howard show a couple of times. He was nice to me, gave me a lot of air time. And then I was on Opie and Anthony for about 10 years as a regular contributor. Those are good, too. I like those guys. They've been good to me. They've been good to, you know, I became really good friends with Anthony, and we used to fight on the air, like spar. And uh, Anthony turned out to be really, in my opinion, uh, first of all, he's a comedic genius, great guy. I and, started I, I started a fight with, between me, or, no, no, Anthony Cumia and John Stewart. <laughs> uh, but we, uh, I, Artie was playing Caroline's, so I went to Caroline's to see Artie, and Anthony was there, and Artie show, shows me in a taxi. We're going down to the comedy cellar. Let's go. So, of course, uh, who, who's not going to jump in a taxi with Artie Lang on its hair, you know? <laughs> so we go down to the comedy cellar, and everybody knows, like, a lot. most of the comedians are upstairs at the bar. And so John Stewart's there, and Anthony's sort of sitting behind me. And John Stewart, I, I was like, I've known John... Since I was like, since he's had his first first show, it was like on Channel Nine, yep. and I, I had gone out with him and his crew. Some I knew some of the writers there, so I had no John and him being a stern fan. So I went up and I said, "Hey, John, what's up?" I don't know if you remember me, Steve Grillo, and he's like, "Oh my God, Grillo, yeah, how you doing? How you been?" I was like, "Nice to see you." Then Anthony gets up and he shoves his hand, like, like shoves his hand in John's face, and he's like, "Hey, man, what's up, Anthony?" And he's like, John's like, Anthony who? And he's like, cool ya. He goes, get your fucking hand out of my fucking face. Fuck you. I'm not shaking your hand. And cool ya's like, oh, come on. He goes, I heard the shit you said about me on the air. You're a piece of shit. Fuck you. Now, Anthony's. I remember the story. I think the story made the papers, right? No, I don't think so, no. So it didn't? Because I no, no. the story. Maybe Anthony told me. Uh, Anthony, Anthony's not someone to back down. He's like, a, he's a tough guy, you know? So oh, yeah. I think no, like, I think just... I like right back in his face. He's like, "Oh, shut up! What are you being a big Hollywood baby? You know, this is the way the business is. We say shit, but doesn't mean that we mean it." And then all of a sudden, then all of a sudden, two guys from John's table get up and stand behind Anthony. And I'm like, "One on one is one thing, but I'm sorry, but if they do anything to Anthony, I'm gonna have to jump in. Uh-huh. You know, I can't like I can't let my friend. I thought that Anthony's a big friend or anything, but I can't let that I happen. Him. I love him." And, you know, we became much closer 
when he went to compound, we had some good talks. Because on Opie and Anthony, we used to spar. And I, I you know, I, I just couldn't believe it. We used to go toe to toe. And he's he's a comedic genius, man. So, you know, it was that's not my domain, obviously. I'm an investigative reporter, but only respect for Anthony Cumia. But I'll answer your question. The bullets in the book, first off, it's the first in-depth interview with Epstein ever. It was uh, recorded years ago. And uh, I'll say this. Through the film I did, Wish You Weren't Here, the expose about Roger Waters and contemporary anti-Semitism, I met everyone. I went to Israel. They gave me access to all the politicians, all the Arab people I met on the other side, the Palestinians. And what I discovered along the way from Secret Service people, because I interviewed a lot of them, was the name Jeffrey Epstein was not only linked to the Mossad, he was in bed with the Saudis, with Mohammed bin Salman, huge, huge friendship there. In fact, Epstein even carried a Saudi passport. And he was also tight with Muammar Gaddafi. Wow. And he was a triple agent. And I really outline all the salient details in the book about Epstein double and triple crossing all these countries in the Middle East to make a buck. And Jamal Khashoggi has been in the news recently. And that's in my book. So, but, was, but, but those Arab leaders, those, those Saudi princes and stuff, don't they like treasure young virgins? Isn't that like one of those things that he well, was probably providing for them? Well, actually, it was on the on the flip side for Epstein giving information to Ben Salman. Ben Salman was giving him cash and a lot of virgins, and some of them flew to his island. It's all in my book, man. But when we get to Stern, there's a lot, you know, well, because I, I started the Stern Odyssey a few years ago, and I pitched it to my publisher, Simon and & Schuster. And they usually take my books. I don't think they've ever refused a proposal from me. And I sent the proposal. And I got a call back from the publisher. And she said, Ian, we can't take this. I said, what do you mean? This is a great book. In fact, the New York Post already announced that I'm doing this book. They said, we can't take this. And she said, I said, why? She said, well, you know, I'm very close to Beth Stern. I publish her books. And also, we have an option on Howard. This was before Howard comes uh, again. Uh, yeah. book came out. So I said, really? You're going to refuse it? I've had a great relationship with you guys. I've written a lot of bestsellers. We've never had a problem. You know, I do my research impeccably. And that was it. That was the last time I ever heard from Simon & Schuster. And I've been with them a long time. And Howard essentially cost me my job. I'm sure they phoned him. Show them the proposal, whatever. Oh, no doubt. And that's it. So flash forward, the book finally comes out now. And there's a lot of stern stuff in there about, you know, A, Sinatra wanted to whack him out because he was doing all these Sinatra skits. Oh, my God. That's one of my favorite skits ever. Frank Sinatra's got Alzheimer's and yeah. he's singing the blues. Sinatra was pissed off to the max. Wow. He phoned his contacts in the mafiosa. And he put a hit on Howard years ago. He actually wow. put a hit on him. Well, and you know, I, I was involved in a situation where, you know, someone I, I stopped someone from killing Howard. They, they, they were sitting with a loaded shotgun in the front of the building, and I told Howard to come around the back. And the guy, was if he would have pulled in the front that morning, the guy would have killed him. Wow. See, there you go. And, how, Howard, and Howard has bullet, he had bulletproof glass at CBS, right? Um, I don't know about CBS because I wasn't there, but I, I, I know I know he you know he does have a gun permit. Yeah, I, I, but I he's talked about that on the air. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, Judith Regan, who's a good friend of mine, and I love Judith Howard forever. She she once told me that he carries a gun all the time. I love. Yeah, Judith. I gave yeah. Judith a massage. Yeah. I had to, I had to I had to drop off some paperwork over to the office, and she's like, yeah. "Come here, honey." And she's she's hot, you know. She like she's, she's like she's like, come here, honey. Just, my back is killing me. Do you mind rubbing my back? I was like, sure. <laughs> Judith is very hot, but you know, Judith is a friend. I have the same birthday as her, August seventeenth. So, you know, we've gone to karaoke. We've gone bowling. I love Judith. Please tell her I said hello. I will. And you so know, remember me. 
another icon in the publishing business, but I'll yep. say this about Howard. What I conclude, we've read all about Ellen, Ellen DeGeneres in the news, being out of whack with her staff and sexual things there, just craziness, and she survived. You know, I thought Ellen was toast last summer, but somehow she talked her way out of it and she's still on. But Howard Stern is in the same league. Emotional terrorism. Abusing his ex-staff. The people who got him there from nothing. Who built him out into a powerhouse. Powerhouse, man. People like yourself. Stuttering John. Jackie. Scott the Engineer. The legendary Tim Sabian. All these people... Got him to the top. Gary Delabate making under a million a year. Robin. People think Robin makes 25, 30 grand a year. 35 million, excuse me. 25, 35 mil a year. She's making like 2.5 a year. And Howard, Howard's laughing to the bank, to the bank, and leaving everybody scrounging for crumbs. How much does he need, Steve? Really? Well, I have said this before he even got to half a million, half of 500 million. You know, I said, if, if I thought about it, and this, again, this is before Sirius. I always said that he's got more money than his kids, kids, kids could spend. Because if you think about it from the beginning of his career, um, say up until before he went to Sirius when he was still on terrestrial radio, he had one house that he bought probably with his first paycheck. It was a nice house in Long Island. It wasn't like a giant mansion, but it did have a tennis court and a pool, and it was a beautiful house, but yeah. it wasn't too extravagant. He never went anywhere, never bought anything, never did anything e extravagant. And so think about how much money he was making he for all those years. Did all those monies. To, did he donate to worthwhile charities back in the day? Well, I'm, I'm sure if he did, he would have bragged about it uh, at, to, to no there end. There you go. So he would, but so think all that money he made for those 20, 25 years where he was making 10, 20 million dollars a year, plus the books, plus the movie, plus the pay per view. He was already had enough money that three generations down the road could not spend that money. On top of the fact that he goes to Sirius and they give him a half a fucking billion dollars. And all the and all the stocks that he had in Infinity Broadcasting and everything else that he probably invested in. I'm sure he has a shrewd broker investing his money. God knows whatever you think he might be worth, it probably tack on another billion. And you know it's the saddest part of all, Steve? Which I say in the book, he's still fucking miserable. Miserable. Yeah. yeah. Miserable. You know, you got to play big. You got to live to enjoy it. Yeah. But Howard Stern, with all that money, has he helped homeless? Has he helped people in dire need of food? Of health issues, cancer, this. Where's the money, man? Is it all in his stash in his closet? It's like that scene from Breaking Bad. It's in a, it's in a locker somewhere. <laughs> it's exactly. It's in mean, a giant he, swimming pool. You know I mean? As you say, he doesn't go out much. Yeah, he goes out to the restaurants in the Hamptons, Bobby Bands, whatever. You know, the guy is. Honestly, quirky, yes. Talented, yes. But motherfucking cheap, yes. If you see, like, Stuttering John making maximum 85K, how can you survive in New York on 85 And then, And then they, they get mad when he goes to get a job that's offering him three times as what he's on making, and they can't match it, and they get mad for him leaving. Well, look what happened to Artie Lang. Artie Lang was being pursued by the Late Late Show, and Howard shut it down. Well, that happened with Quivers, and it also happened with Fred Norris. Robin Quivers was supposed to have an Oprah-type show, and they did a test pilot, and I know how talented Robin Quivers is, and I know that's something that she would have been great at. Yep. That disappeared. Coming off of the success of Private Parts, Fred Norris was getting acting roles left and right. That went away. Stuttering John and both Fred Norris are two talented, successful musicians 
that that have two albums that I listen to to this day, where yeah. I know every word to every song, but there was no help in ever promoting that for them. Here's a little tidbit of information, a little little piece of trivia that not, not many people know. Who is the opening act of the very first Ozfest? Was it Fred? It was King Norris, Fred Norris's band. <laughs> they, if you look at the lineup, the very first act of Ozfest yeah. was King Norris, well, and I, I only happened to know that because I Fred got me tickets. I flew out to Anaheim, very California. Talented. My ridiculously talented, like Stevie Ray Vaughan. Supposed to boost the people who got you there instead of bringing them down like desperados, like dogs, keeping them down in the gutter. Come on, yep. Howard. You can so do what, better than that. Howard, I know you're watching this. I know you're watching this. And I'm telling you to your face, to your face, Howard. Shame on you. Shame on you. We're not afraid of you, Howard. We are not afraid of you. What you did to Scott the Engineer, to Stuttering John, to Tim Sabian when he told you his father was dying of cancer and you said, let's part ways. Howard, I'm, I don't hate you, man. I think you're talented. And yes, you really did a lot for talk radio. But you're a sellout. You used to take on all the celebrities, but the only thing you wanted to do was be part of them. And now you're masturbating, baby, on their left fucking leg. <laughs> and you're miserable. You're miserable, man. You know, the rumblings are the marriage isn't as, you know, Romeo and Juliet as you think in that household. There's been yeah. a lot of fireworks, my sources say. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, I've I've heard uh, rumblings, but I I, you know, the weird thing is, you know, I was a kid when I started working there. I was like 19 years yeah. old. I like just got out of high school basically, and I kind of got in, and the doors shut behind me. But guess who is the same age as me? Beth. Beth. So if you, like, it's kind of weird if you think about. It. I was like this young baby, like this young kid working for Howard, and you know, I was you know, I, I was treated like a, like a kid because I was, and not in a bad way, but. His wife was the same age as me. I don't know if that's ever kicked in with him, you know? You know, it doesn't kick in with him. Because all that money, the self-proclaimed king of all media, and nobody lasts forever. We've seen, recently, we've seen Imus go. We've seen Larry King go. We've seen Limbaugh go. Regis Philbin gone. Nothing lasts forever, Steve. We all know yeah. We're not stupid here. But this guy is perpetually not happy. Not even happy with Beth oh, a thousand percent. That's what I'm, I'm happy. I'm you happy and I ain't got a, you ain't got a pot to piss in. If it's Taylor in her prime, he won't be happy. Farrah yeah. Fawcett in her prime. You could give him the top porn stars in the world next to him. He won't be happy. Yeah. So He's is there anything... God. Is there anything exactly. groundbreaking that you're going to tell me here that's going to make like like well, like blow people up? The marriage sources say, you know, there's a lot of work to be done there if they're going to keep it together. Yeah. The other thing, obviously, you know, he dyes his hair. Well, is is it his hair? Is the other question? They say it's wheat. He used to have the. He has a stylist, Tony. Do you know Tony? I know Tony very well. Who comes in every morning five, yeah. five in the morning and does his hair? That's normal. Every show has that in the green. Yeah, room. no, no. Well, you know where Tony is a product of private parts. Yeah. Because you know, obviously, it, it's no, it's no, it's nothing new. Everybody knew that that was a wig that he wore in private parts. And the woman that was on private parts that did that was she's probably the best wig maker person that we go to if anybody any celebrity that's having a hair issue or they need to enhance their hair for any type of movie she's the one that you go to i don't know if she's still in the business she's probably retired she's a wonderful woman i wish i could remember her name off the top but tony, tony coburn what's that tony coburn no no it, it, tony was her protege oh i see i see so so tony well like she worked exclusively on howard's hair yeah on on the set 
with with the wig that he wore on set. And then so Tony was the Tony. I'm not saying what he's wearing right now is a wig. I can't if I'm not in person. I can't tell. So yeah. what I'm saying is, in the movie Private Parts, that was the wig. And the person yeah. that got him is that wig is one of the best in the TV and film business. Oh yeah. That's right. So Tony Colburn was, was her our protege, and she gave her to Howard. Yes. Like not like a not like a Jeffrey Epstein thing, but you know, she said Tony's the best, and Howard probably offered her a great salary because up until then, Ralph used to do his hair. You know, and uh, yeah. you know, you show the way it looked. So you go back to the early '90s, the way his hair looked, and it was uh, it was kind of pathetic. Oh yeah, it was all it was really scary, scary, and, and you know. Even the way it is now, I, I pity poor Beth having to turn over every morning and see Howard. I, I think she could, you know, be caused a heart attack over this. But Epstein, I say in the book, was completely obsessed with Stern. But they never over, met. He you, stopped, they never hung out? Not according to Epstein at the time. Okay. But he admitted he stalked him. He stalked wow. him. He stalked Princess Di. He stalked Howard. He stalked Carla Bruni. He was obsessed with her too. He hated Sarkozy, who's also in the news now. But and now also, now you're saying Jeffrey Epstein is the one who introduced Dodie to Diana. Yes, one thousand percent. If not for Jeffrey Epstein, Princess Diana would be alive today. He, you know, it's funny Diana. watching watching The Crown and everything now, and you see like you you go back and you look at the, you know I was a kid, so you don't really think that you know she was an adult, blah blah blah. But now I go back and I'm watching all this other stuff. She was absolutely beautiful. Absolutely. And she was seemed like such a kind, warm, wonderful, loving person. Yes. And just Part got shit on by the royal family. Didn't ask to get involved. This guy was in love with somebody else that he couldn't that he couldn't uh, be with. And that's all he obsessed with. And he just basically hopped well, on top of sham. her. The whole thing yeah. was a sham. I mean, she was a virgin. And... You know, it's not like Sarah Ferguson who banged half, you know, half of England before she married Prince Andrew. This was the perfect pedigree for the royal family, royal material Princess Diana. Perfect for an older man who really, as you perfectly said, he was in love with another woman. And the whole marriage was just, again, for the royal family to profit shamelessly the royal family seriously and i'm not saying this lightly they make el chapo look like a straight guy yeah i'm sure and you know they, they all worship her too which is kind of pathetic yeah you know so you look what's going on with harry and megan now why did they leave they left for a reason yeah they saw through the whole scam and they yep. wanted to get the fuck out of there man because yep. they knew they well, he's not going to be king. Lives. Yeah, yeah. That, that old witch won't fucking die anytime soon. She'll outlive everybody. Yeah. Well, Prince Philip apparently is on his deathbed now. We're going to see if Harry I saw that. makes the trip to England to say goodbye to his grandfather. But Howard Stern, man. You know, you know, I have a quick question. Yeah. Do you think the Queen of England wipes her own ass? <laughs> Absolutely. No, seriously, think about it. Did, did, did she, like, or does she have like a royal wiper of a, 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 a chamber pot person or something? What was that? That was a, ass, uh, you know, has probably a fancy toilet there, but uh, you know. The <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have had that off. asparagus. <laughs> and, and Prince Philip, hey, he's banged a lot on the side. Yeah, I'm One sure. Time, I mean, that's been outed before. That's you think? Yeah, you think that said that the queen spreading her legs every night? Hell no. We're men. We need to have sex. Yeah, the queen ain't getting it from Philip. They're, they've yeah. been estranged for decades. In fact, somebody told me, I think it's in the book, they, ha they haven't fucked since like 1977 or something. Do you, do you think that she masturbates or she did at one point? Yeah, of course. It's Everybody masturbates. When, when was the last <laughs> time you jacked off? Five o'clock this morning? There you go. There you go. <laughs> it must have been to a chick in the Dominican Republic. It wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't to Beth Stern or Howard Stern. Oh no way, no way, not not my type. The two times I met her, she couldn't have been any nastier. Oh, she looked so at me like I was what, dirt underneath of. Because you yeah. legend, Howard Stern, saint or sinner? Um, I think he's. A, I think he's a good. I think the bottom line is he's a good dude. Um. 
I can't say anything in my personal, like off the air, and anything that he did with me because I was there. Pick, I had to pick him up every morning. I had to walk him down every day for, for almost eight years, and he was always so kind and nice to me. Um, off the air, and he, I never seen him be mean to anybody else, as far as anybody that came up to him for autographs. And it was pretty much mind blowing when his books came out. That the amount of people that came out to get the autograph, his autograph, and how when the line was cut off and the line went down all the way down Fifth Avenue, wrapped around the St. Patrick's Cathedral, came back around, it was on Sixth Avenue, down a couple of blocks. The line was insane. And New Howard, Ford. New Ford. Howard, Howard made sure that everybody that was on that line at the time it was cut off, no matter how long it took him, he signed everybody's book. And I was there for the and every time he signs people's book, he looked them in the face and said, Thank you. You know, a lot and of these people, especially off, because my experience with Howard was great. I thought he was such a nice guy when I went on his show. He's a nice Jewish boy from Long Island. His parents yeah. obviously did a great job raising him, but he was able to find something, a niche where you know, he just like every other sick guy, he, the way we think. He was able to do that and make money from it. You know, it's like this, this is basically what me and my friends do when we're sitting around hanging at the bar. We're, we're, we're doing what they did on the air, you know? And he just took it and figured out a way to make money from it. Yeah, and kudos to him. But again, yeah. again, when you look at Ellen DeGeneres, what she did, she should have been let go, fired. And when you yeah, but she's Howard, doing it behind the scenes. Howard was honest. He abused yeah. you all the other. Like, that's one thing my dad couldn't understand. My dad's like a quiet, sensitive Italian guy. Nothing like my mother who's a maniac. So but that's where I get it from. But my dad's a quiet. And I told my dad, don't listen. Don't tell anybody at the post office that I, you know, I'm working for Howard. And what did he do? He told everybody at the post office, that's my son. And then, of course, I'm getting abused on the air. My dad doesn't like to hear that to begin with, let alone the guys at the post office are going, hey, Gorilla, we heard what happened to your son this morning. So my dad would come home in a fucking rage. A yeah. rage. Like, why did he have to do that? Why did he have to say that? And I dad, dad, I, you don't understand. He yeah. does that because people are stuck in traffic and they're laughing, and that's what that's he's right. getting paid to do. It's not no. fun if he pats me on the back and he says, good job. And you yeah. know what, Dad? When he goes, we'll be back right after these words, and he turns that microphone off, he always goes, man, great job, Grillo. You don't understand that. And I, I used to hide my dad's batteries from his Walkman so he couldn't listen because I knew he was too cheap to buy new batteries. <laughs> Look, <laughs> I, I balance the book. I say he's a good guy. And I say yeah. he's a look. He revolutionized talk radio, and what what he did with satellite. Kudos, kudos. But still, yeah. and I'm asking you this: Is there any difference in a workplace between emotional terrorism and sexual abuse? Ah, uh, I, I think emotional terrorism is bad because you kind of take that home with you. You take that home with you, it kind of sticks you. It's better like it's coming at you for who you are. And sexual harassment is it comes in a very close second because you're 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 breaking that 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 comfortable zone, that that personal space zone that that, that should evolve yeah. in the workplace and that yes. you're breaking that, but that, but that's They're physical that's disgusting. physical, that's physical, and you can fight back from physical. But when you're an emotional wreck, it's so much harder to fight back. Yes, but they're both disgusting. Absolutely, 100%. Intolerable. Yeah. And that's my only point with Howard. Yeah, I respect the guy, talented, wealthy, kudos to him. He did it. But still, when he tells Stuttering John to abort his child, that he wouldn't be a good father in the workplace, that's, that's not called for, man. No, I know you couldn't get away with it these days, but it was and amazing that the shit Stark that he got. An engineer, you know, hey, Marcy Turks told him you can't. You can do the the GoFundMe, but you can't do it under the Howard Stern banner or you know, that you work here. Come on, man. The Look, I, I, said, I said, I said, I said. First of all, he's he's abused Scott more than probably Gary is a second close, but he really he, Scott went through some serious shit. He made him wear a fucking thong and walk around with a dunce cap on on you know on Madison Avenue, and he did a lot of shit. And he's also included his wife on the air 
She's about Robin was a sweet woman. She made, like, and she used to come on the air and do shit. So what it what could have been done, it could have been silent, could have been quiet. Yo, Scott, give me the bill. I got this. Just don't talk about it. There and, you go. And, and, and it would have been, it would have been fine. It could, it could have been just on the DL, you know. Steve, that's my point. When you say he was great to you, he used to pat you on the back, he used to tell you, fine. Did he give me any money? No, but I was having a, I was having a bipolar action. Yeah. In a sense, yeah, he's good on one side. Look, El Chapo, man. Maybe he was good to his wife. Maybe he used to cook dinner for his kids, but on the other fucking side, do we give him a pass? And that's what I'm saying with Howard Stern. There's got to be one fucking set of rules in this business for everyone because too many people are getting fired. We're all walking on eggshells. And yes, yeah. bring it up. Set the bar higher. But if you set it for one person, hey, set it for everyone, baby. No shit. No double standards, brother. Can't stand them. And that's it. That's my point. So, Howard, yes, nice guy. He gave a lot of people opportunity. But on the other side, He's emotionally terrorizing people like Tim Sabian, Scott the Engineer, Stuttering John, many others. Do we give him a free pass? Yeah, well, he's going to get it because uh, if he got a free pass with the, with with the blackface incident and saying he never he, he never yeah, used how the N word, how did he get out of that? How did he get out of that? He used the N word so many times. You know what I'm saying? North America, they're going down. Oh, they would have been crucified. They would have attacked them Never at their house. Black, Black Lives Matter would have been... God, yeah. you're God. Yep. But with Howard Stern, he can Look, somehow... Boy, dude, the richer you are, the bigger pass... that you, The bigger hole pass you have. And it's really that simple. He's got... He's a billionaire. You can buy your way out of so shit Are like you that. saying that Howard Stern, the self-proclaimed king of all media, is paying off? Well, here's the deal. First of all, he's all those uh, media outlets that would normally destroy somebody are all like they're all in cahoots together. Steve Grillo, you're a straight arrow, and I like your interviewing and your technique. And don't worry about Rogan. Don't look around. Oh well, you know he's just a, he's he's the gold standard at this point. That's don't who you, worry you know. about that. Howard, he was looking around at Imus and all these. You got dizzy, man. You don't need yeah. the whole pie. You just need to push forward, live a good, healthy life, and not be miserable. Otherwise, all your money is going to go to therapists like the king of all media. How much do you spend on those therapy, therapy? Oh, I can't imagine. I've got more money than I've ever made in my life. I'm How sure. many new cars is the therapist driving because of the yeah. king of all media? Parking, parking is an issue no matter where you go. Finding a parking spot can be so incredibly frustrating. As you know, especially someone who lived in Hell's Kitchen, you you it's, you know you have alternate side of the street parking where you have to like wait there there's and no then parking there. there's parking. no parking. But but every once in a while, you win the lotto, you get a parking spot. And Street parking. Spot Me is uh, you can find it on uh, the Play Store. You can download it for free. So basically, it's like if you're looking for a spot and you're in a neighborhood, and you say I'm in this area, and then all of a sudden, ping, someone's leaving. So you pay six dollars on the app. Love you know, $6 for a parking spot in New York is pretty goddamn good. Amazing. So, so you, you go and you, you, you go there and they leave and you come in and then you, you, you say, okay, I got the spot. And then the person that had the spot that paid the $6 gets $4 back if you swap out the spot. So for $2, you can get a parking spot. Stern made Gary Park a few blocks away from Sirius. He wouldn't give him a spot. And I interviewed, I spoke to Opie for Anthony during my research. I spoke to everybody on that floor, the 36th floor. So they said, Opie told me, even I spoke to him a few days ago uh, for the first time in probably a couple of years. And he told me still, he maintains his story. He tried to get close to Stern. Stern was roped off coming in to Sirius. He thought he was like Madonna or Michael Jackson or some mega superstar. And he would, nobody's allowed to talk to him. Opie approached him once and said, whoa, 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 you can't talk to Howard. Come on. Man. Yeah, it, was, it really wasn't like that when I was there because his office was in, like, 
you know, was in, he'd walk the hall, you know, the, 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 the hallways of K-Rock. And yeah. the salespeople knew enough to let him alone, but he knew everybody's name. He knew like, all the people in the promotions department. He it would changed. walk by and say good morning, hello to everybody. It changed, and you know that, Steve. You've heard, yeah. the, you've heard what's gone on. Come on, you're yeah. no, I more should... than anybody. It yeah. changed. Howard thought he was a huge superstar. He told people, you're not allowed to talk to me. He told that to Scott the Engineer when he, he went to him for the money, you know, for his dying wife. He said no, and he had to go talk to Marcy Turks. But the yeah. bottom line is, in life, man, and I'm telling you this as transparent as I can, and I want everybody to take note, and especially Howard Stern who's watching this. you got to be a person first. I don't give a fuck how much money you have. If you're not a good person first, you're a zero. You're a nobody, and you don't deserve to have the platform. I hear you, man. Where can everybody find your book? What? Where are you? Where are you on Twitter? Where's all the social media? Because I saw you got some. Uh, you're gonna have to help me out because I gotta get my numbers up. And I see you have some pretty good numbers on Twitter and stuff. So, you know, I I, I kind of draw. I didn't I didn't buy into Twitter in the first like Steve, five years, so relax. I don't have that big of numbers. Relax, Steve. In life, it's not how you start, baby. It's how you finish. You're going. To, you're gonna hit a home run. You're gonna have the pick of the creme de la creme. You're on your way. Relax. It's going. Every day is going up, man. You know, you're not like the stock market that's up, down, all around. You're not like Howard, who's in therapy, doesn't know where he is. You're going up. You're going up. So just relax. It's not how you start. It's how you finish. And I'll tell yeah. you, I'm on Ian Undercover on Twitter. At okay. Ian Undercover. And please drop me a line. I will respond. At Ian Undercover, my book, Controversy, Sex, Lies, and Dirty Money, starring Jeffrey Epstein, starring G. Lane Maxwell, starring Prince Salman, Saudi Arabia, starring the king of all media, is in there. Howard Stern, two chapters on it. It's available on Amazon, and please go get it. I guarantee you, page turner, every page, Revelations. And also my interview with Epstein, seven-hour interview. Wow, I can't wait to get a hold of this. Uh, it's going to be a good read, I know that for sure. So, and uh, yeah, everybody, Steve Gorilla at Twitter, Gorilla Vader on Instagram, and everybody can find the Aftershock Excel page on Facebook. I accept everybody unless you're a jerk, and then I kick you off. <laughs> Steve, Same you're goes a with anything. Arrow, man. A straight I, arrow. I, 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 that's that's a compliment to me, considering that I, you know, I, I, I I'm an avid bow shooter. I, I have a nice bow, and being a straight arrow is a good thing in my book. I appreciate that. I appreciate straight you arrow, coming on. Steve, one last question. Yes, sir. When was the last time you spoke to Howard? Uh, a couple of years ago, America's Got Talent. I went to one show, and Ralph wouldn't let me go up and talk to him. Ralph said, "No, don't." So I didn't. But then Ronnie found out, I guess later on, Ralph and Ronnie were all together. And Ralph told Howard that I was there. And he got mad at Ralph for not telling him that I was there. And why did you tell him not to come over? So the next show that I went to during a commercial break, I went up to say hello to him. And the you know, last time he saw me, I was probably like 28 years old. Now I'm like 43, 44. So it was a good 20 years. And he was like, oh, my God. He's like... You're not a little kid anymore. You're like a grown man. Because I had like a long goatee. And I congratulated him and told him I thought he was doing a great job. And I was happy for them. And then they were coming back at a commercial break. So he was really genuinely excited to see me. And was happy to see me. No. Especially after all the shit that I've been saying about him. (laughs) You know, I don't don't say he's a bad guy. But I will tell the the truth. Do you still have his number? I never had his number. Never had his number. Never had his number. I had Robin's number. Um, uh, I had Gary's. When was the last I had... time you spoke to Robin? <sighs> that that one is kind of painful because I did. I, you know, it was right when Marcy Turk started, and they came out in the paper with all the Marcy Turk stuff about how she's running game and everything, and how yeah. he's turned into someone else. And I was uh, at Comic Con with a good friend of mine. She's a comedian, Stacy Frustman. And she couldn't get on the, the Wi-Fi, so she, I, downloaded, I downloaded Periscope, and I went on, and I was kind of had a couple of cocktails at the bar before I went, so I was feeling a little loose. 
And we started doing this. She was interviewing me like as a joke. And I was doing it basically because the article came out the day before. And so I was reiterating everything that said in the article about how he, he doesn't, you know, no looking backwards. He's everything's going forwards. The old staff will never have him on again. How Marcy Turk is in charge. How Howard's become the person that he used to make fun of. So I was reiterating the article sort of in a joking way. And I didn't know somebody on Periscope just happened to be working for uh, Radar Online. Yep. And Radar Online did a whole big piece about what I said. So, like, the next day, all of a sudden, I'm getting, like, all these alerts. My phone, people are contacting me. I'm like, what the fuck is this? Someone sent me the article. And I'm like, Radar Online. And I turn to my buddy Roy and I go, what's Radar Online? Is that a big deal? He goes, oh, only to about two to three million people a day. By CMI. Yeah, so... Um, so I was going up to meet Robin for lunch and I was up at Sirius and she was going to bring me back into the office and she goes, so I'm in the lobby waiting for her and she comes out and she goes, did you do an article about bashing Howard? I was like, what? She goes, did you do something for Radar Online? I went, no, I was goofing around on the radio. I was goofing on my friend's phone and they picked up a, a, a stupid thing I was doing. Okay, I was like, I didn't know. She, she goes, let well, you in. No, she goes, you're banned, and she like shut the door. And that was the last time I spoke to her. So don't you, here we go. You just hit the nail on the head. But she's she was like I was I was out of culture there. Out of everybody on that show, she was my closest friend. Ever been Robin? No, 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 no. Never attraction there. Just we were just always no, very good you're friends. Sure now. We went to, we, yeah, 100%. No, I do like women of color. I have no prejudice as far as the way beauty goes, but that's nothing that I would, uh, if she was like a family member kind of, it would have been weird and gross and awkward. But um, no, we used to go to the movies like at least once a week. She'd take me out to lunch. She'd take me to the theater. She'd take me to dinner. You ever We'd sleep hang out and watch movies. You ever sleep No, I never, I never, I never slept at her house. But I used to go over her house all the time and watch movies. Just chill. We'd go and chill out and hang out. So, so uh, Robin all these years? It's funny you said that because, like, I remember, you know, she she was like celibate for so long, and I know her, I know her, I knew her so well because I, I I did the news for her every day too. I I did everything for everybody. Was she and, in the closet? No, she wasn't in the closet. But you know, I think she had certain health issues, and she was on medication, yeah. and she really. So one morning I came in, and she's like, "Good morning, Grillo," and I go, "I said your covers. Did you get yeah. laid or something?" She goes, oh, I did, I did. Don't tell anybody. Like we, we, we always had the don't oh, tell anybody oh. thing where if, if we had that lock, if, I, if she said don't tell anybody, we, we didn't tell anybody. We had secrets, both of us. And she was dating, they called him Mr. X. And um, she just started dating him. It was an old boyfriend from back in the day. They, re, they got back together and uh, they started, you know, but I knew right away that she got laid. It was like so weird. <laughs> She was like so you happy. Ever banged Robin back in no, the day? no, no, no. You know, sometimes when you're that close to friendship, no, not even that. I, I do believe, as far as I know, from every part of my, my my being there and knowing him, that he didn't cheat. He might have cheated after I left, but I think he was too afraid to get caught. Okay, but let's call a spade a spade. When he split with Allison, I mean, he was out in a boat, man. Yeah, out in a boat. He was banging. Which, I think, which is his right. Yeah. So um, he you ever uh, go to scores. You ever go to scores with Howard? Dude, I was the reason why they were at scores. Lonnie Hanover was a really good friend of mine before scores. He was the the publicist for a, a nightclub in Manhattan called Club Expo. Oh yeah. And I I was uh, you know that's where I sort of became friends with Lonnie, and he was like he was amazing. He was a big Stern fan, and Lonnie. Um, uh, oh, he says, Steve, I'm leaving Expo. I got this new job at this high end strip club, and he, it was like it's. It was. I lived on 61st Street. It was on 59th Street. I lived on 65th Street. It was on 59th Street. It was right underneath the 59th Street Bridge, and I lived yep. so close. And Lonnie said, I took this job with one stipulation that I have carte blanche with. The, whoever I want to let in, and would, I don't, I, I, there is no ceiling to my, you know, of how much money I could spend there. So I would go every night because Lonnie was a friend and he knew I was a broke intern. 
he would go and call me up and say, you coming down? And I go, oh, I didn't want to take advantage. He goes, Steve, I told you. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it, I, 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 could, I could spend anything. I said, I know, but last night you took care of me. I don't want to. He goes, Steve, I already ordered you a filet mignon. You better get here before it gets cold. So, of course, I go there. I'm drinking for free. I'm eating, like, gourmet food every single night. And I would go there because I was a sick maniac back then. I, don't, I couldn't do it now. But I was basically living on two-hour naps. So I would go out to scores until, like, maybe 1, 2 o'clock at night. I'd go take a little two, two-hour, three-hour nap. And then I'd go to the radio station, and I'd still be half in the bag. You know, and Howard would be like, how many strippers did you bang your scores over the years? It wasn't that many, man. I got more laid from doing an off Broadway play than I did from. I didn't have that game that I should have had. You know, I when I was doing Grandma Sylvia's funeral, I got more chicks from that than I did at scores. But I'm not saying I didn't bring home a couple of them. I, you know, I did. But um, so I would go tell Howard. I was like, Howard, you don't understand. This place is mind blowing. The girls are like, they're like top ten. They're like top models. Yeah, and they're, they're, they're gorgeous and they're friendly and it's such an amazing place. And then, you know, I would tell them and then finally I got Gary to go and John to go. And they'd come back and they were like, Howard, yo, you got to We got to go to this place. So it wasn't until Fred Norris came back from a summer break that he went and got married over the two week vacation and came back and Howard was mad at him because there's a blown opportunity for a bachelor party. So Lonnie called up and was like, we got the bachelor party. So the first time that Howard ever went was because of me. And Lonnie called me up and was like, tell him I got this. And we, we he goes, we'll open up during the afternoon. No one will be there. I'll have security. And we walked in and there was like originally like six or seven of us and like 30 girls. And I like filet mignon, lobster this tail. This was like, like the best buffet ever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he handed Gary Delabate $25,000 in funny money. Wow. And basically, Howard, after that, it was just legendary. So, Howard Stern, was he going in the back room at scores? No, no, there wasn't. A, we were in the VIP room, but I didn't see anything going on. You know, but, but it was like, there was no private area. I didn't see any, like, there was, I never saw him leave and go to a private area. Everybody was in the same room. Was he just looking or was he getting dances? Like, come on. You might, you know, he had his sweatpants on. Who knows? Maybe he came in his pants. I don't know. I, I don't want to know. I don't give a shit. I, but, you know, um, it was some of the best parties that, that I've ever been to in my entire life. I'm sure it was a great time. So because of you, Stern started frequenting scores. Yeah. And um, the guy who wrote the book on scores, yeah. yes, I've been telling this story for years. And uh, my buddy Roy wound up, you know, reading the book and the guy mentions it. He doesn't mention my name in the book, but he goes, our publicist had a good friend that worked on the Howard Stern show that used to come in. And that's how, how so in the book, it's actually confirmed sure. through Lonnie Hanover. And it's all Lonnie. He knew that he knew eventually Lonnie was a good friend, but he knew that he didn't have to ask me to tell Howard about it, that I would anyway. And you got the royal treatment there. It was Every unreal. single time I walked in the door, I could walk in with 10 people and I would be, all my friends were like, well, it was kind of fun, like having like kids I grew up with, like from grammar school and shit like that. Like, oh, we'd all, I remember one night and we all went out and they were like, I can't believe that you, of all people, dude, they just opened up the door. We get drank for free. We're in the VIP room. Holy shit, Steve. You know, like these old people I grew up with. That was like, I was like, I was like, yeah, that's right. That's how I do. You, you know, know about the strip clubs, I gotta say, man, it's so smoke and mirror. Because really, if we turn up the lights, let's see what we really got here. Let's see what we really got. How hot, quote unquote hot these girls actually are. And yeah. I wonder, it would be very interesting to see how many years ago was this when you started going? Probably nineteen ninety-five. Okay. So wow, that's a long time ago. Um Wow. It would be interesting to see those girls today, how they look. Yeah. No, it well, would listen, be so interesting. Well, you know, a lot of them, well, it, no, I think it would because the way the, the way the, the healthy culture that goes on today and stuff like that, you know, these girls probably, they all took care of themselves back in the yeah. day, you know, so they, they're they probably all health conscious and shit. Really uh, pleasure enjoy. having you on, man. This was, a, this was really cool. And uh, much you success to, to you and your book. And uh, I'll get your number. We'll stay in touch. Maybe we'll go to the Absolutely. DR together. No, I want to go to South America with you. Oh, it's the best. Thank you, All right. Brother. All right, bud.